Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the final event in our 2021 Winter Buzz Breakfast Series. My name is Ed Manning. I'm the Executive Director of Leadership Asheville, and I'm thrilled that you're able to join us this morning. We have been talking about creative place, equitable creative placemaking over the last three months, um, and really glad you're able to join us. If you haven't heard the conversations that we started in January, they are on our website at www.leadershipashville.unca.edu. And we recorded those so you can go back and hear them if you heard them the first time or um, listen to them for the first time. We start with the former mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landrew, who was talking about his work in removing Confederate monuments in, uh, in that city. Uh, we followed that in February with Paul Farber from Monument Lab. They're working, what is a monument? What does it represent? How do we change the look and feel of those? How long should they last? And last month, we had Dr. Maria Jackson from Arizona State University with us talking about, and she's an expert in create, uh, equitable creative placemaking. Today, we're going to shift our focus and look more toward a local panel around what are we doing in our community to make Asheville an equitable, creative place. We're really thrilled to be doing that. Before we get into that, I want to say a few thank yous for the folks who've made this happen. Begin first with our presenting sponsor, the Van Winkle Law Firm. Much gratitude to the Van Winkle Law Firm. We really thank them. Not only do they uh, are they presenting sponsor for this Buzz Breakfast series, but they are a leadership sponsor of Leadership Asheville. They have a real commitment to developing leaders in our community, and we are really grateful for all their support um, throughout the years. I also want to thank our platinum sponsors, the North Carolina Arts Council and Explore Asheville, the Buncombe County Tourism Development Authority. They have been extremely helpful in making this event happen. And it's my pleasure this morning to actually introduce the president and CEO, the new president and CEO, um, Ms. Victoria Isley. I'm going to ask I'm going to ask Ms. Isley to join me on stage. She goes by Vic, um, and her over, her, over her 25-year career, she's represented destinations such as the Isle of Bermuda, Washington, D.C., Tampa Bay, Florida, and Durham, North Carolina. Solidifying her dedication to placemaking, she was the chief operating officer for what is now Destinations International, the world's largest destination marketing trade association representing 600 organizations worldwide. She also operated as the executive director of its foundation, and she's been recognized as one of Hospitality Sales and Marketing Association's international top 25 minds in hospitality and travel sales marketing. I don't know about you, but starting a job um, in the middle of a pandemic is probably not the easiest thing to do, um, but that's exactly what she's done, and so we are thrilled to have her joining us this morning to say a few words of welcome. Vic, would you join me on stage? Turn on your camera and your microphone. Good morning, so great to have you with us. Thank you, thanks Ed, so glad to be here. Um, as Ed said, I'm Vic Isley, uh, President and CEO for Explore Asheville and the Buncombe County Tourism Development Authority. I'm so pleased to be a part of this community, and I can't wait to meet all of you in 3D one day very soon. Um, I grew up in North Carolina and have long admired Asheville as a community of, of creatives. Um, and so I'm so proud that we're a sponsor of this Winter Buzz Breakfast series with such an important subject. Um, since my time on the ground here in Asheville, been on a listening tour to hear from leaders uh, throughout the broader community, as well as the tourism community, about building a way forward um, for an important sector here um, in the region. Um, with that, our board has been working on its annual planning retreat two weeks ago, where the team adopted four strategic pillars that will be building our efforts around in the coming years. Um, those are first, um, deliver balanced recovery 
and sustainable growth. So how do we want to think about building back the important tourism sector and the experience delivery? And how do we think about that in a sustained way for our community and for our residents? Um, second is to encourage safe and responsible travel. So right now that safety is still very critical coming out of COVID and the pandemic. But certainly with more people receiving vaccines over the last coming weeks, we're, we're seeing um, a new beginning in travel and people and as humans looking for that uh, benefit of travel coming up through the summer and throughout the end of the year. So we wanna make sure that Asheville is in the hearts and minds of travelers when they are ready. Um, but that responsible travel is also thinking about um, our shared values of this community along with our visitors and how do we engage with those visitors in a way that um, creates respect and um, caring for our natural resources that attract so many visitors here, as well as the humans that deliver experiences for those guests um, to Asheville. Third is engage and invite more diverse audiences. So how do we intentionally extend a genuine invitation um, to black travelers, to people of color, um, to the LGBTQ audience? And how do we ensure that once we do so, we're connecting them with our local neighborhoods, businesses, and entrepreneurs. So we're creating more opportunities for all to win here in our own community. And fourth, but certainly not least, is to pr promote and support Asheville's creative spirit. We wanna make sure we're shining a spotlight on the creators and makers that make this community so distinct. And we also want to make sure that we're supporting them through our grant making efforts. Um, so we look forward to working through those pillars with our with our partners in the community because we can't do it alone. And certainly looking forward to an engaging conversation uh, and, and learnings uh, later today. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. I really appreciate your support with this program and really am looking forward to having time in person where we can do some work to get more work together. Uh, that 3D piece is really key. And I know your experience that you bring is going to be really helpful in, in bringing Asheville back. So thank you for joining us this morning. It's my pleasure. Thank you. I also want to thank our featured sponsors. They've been very supportive of making this happen. Uh, AB Tech Community College, Asheville uh, ADL Technologies, Arby's, Lenore Ryan University Equity and Diversity Institute, also Ra Raul Real Estate Group, uh, UNC Asheville, well, we're a program of that, but specifically the African Americans in Western North Carolina and Southern Appalachia and young professionals of Asheville. They've all um, have featured banners around the room. And if you haven't had a chance to go visit them, please do so at the end of the program and tell them thank you for having this, um, making this whole thing possible and bringing these people here um, to talk about it. Thanks to our table sponsors, the Biltmore Home Trust Bank, 103.3 Asheville FM and Western Carolina University. Really appreciate the support they give us each year. And to our leadership sustaining partners who support the whole of Leadership Asheville, what we do throughout the entire year, TD Bank, WastePro, and the Van Winkle Law Firm. Without them, we would not be able to exist. So thank you very much. Also to our community partners, their in-kind contribution allows us to really effectively deliver what we do. Blue Ridge Public Radio, Gray Line Trolleys, um, and the YMCA Blue Ridge Assembly. Really appreciate their support. Uh, and lastly, I wanna thank the Buzz Planning Team, Katie Cornell, Susie Chandler, Michael Murphy, KP Whaley, and Lauren Yoder. They've been extremely helpful in bringing this program to life and, and finding the correct people and speakers who we've seen and had the chance to work with. So a big thank you to them. If you see them at the tables, stop by and say hello and thank you to them. They've done an outstanding job. And with that, for this morning's program, uh, I would like to, we're gonna start actually with an overview from Steph monson Dahl. Steph is the City of Asheville Strategic Design and Development Manager. 
Um, and she and her coworkers are charged with helping the community create the most livable city they can imagine. And to fulfill that, she combines her understanding of how public sector investment can support talented people and enhance the existing potential of great places with her well-honed skills in small area planning, community engagement, and strategies, strategies to support creative place making. Please welcome Ms. Dahl. Staff, you wanna join me on stage? And it took me a minute to get the mic on. Thank you so much, Ed. That was a lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for being here. Great. So I'm going to uh, share some slides. Just taking me a minute here, folks. Okay, everything looking good? So yeah, I, I was asked to um, provide basically an overview uh, to, to start some conversations. Um, but what I want to do is actually first start with a land acknowledgement, which is it's a good place for us to start. Um, this beautiful place that we are all able to find opportunities in was um, or taken from uh, Native peoples. And in our case, in our region, that is uh, Cherokee peoples. And it's good for us to keep that in mind because I think that in much of the past discussions of these the past three uh, Buzz Breakfasts, we've been talking about how the impact of serial displacement and our systems of oppression of cultures that don't look, you know, they, they look like um, cultures that aren't exactly representing people like me, how we're oppressing them and how that relates to our built environment today. So I, I am not an expert in equitable creative placemaking. So I'm no Paul Farber, but uh, what I can tell you is that um, I, I am a go-to person in the power of public space. And public space is the invisible framework that supports all of your lives. It's something that you don't think about very often, but it ranges from when you have a meaningful conversation with a neighbor and find out something really important as you're working in a community garden, or your anxiety levels that you might have about whether or not a, a roadway is congested or clogged and you're gonna get to work on time. It's checking to see if you got an email back from a job application while you're sitting on a, a bench waiting for the bus. These, these things are really the, what we do every day in our lives. And the reason that I'm here today, if I'm not an, uh, an expert in equitable creative placemaking is is because I'm in a position of power. I represent the city of Asheville and the city of Asheville and other local governments and public agencies have enormous power in our lives when you think about all of the spaces that um, they manage, but it's for us. And my one of my big points today or what I'd like, I wish I could do a whole presentation on just this is that while it's hard for us to remember, like even if we don't own a single silver of private property, um, that, that we are the co-owners of an enormous amount of public space and that it's our right to be able to participate in the creation and the design and most importantly, the performance of those spaces. And it might even perhaps be our duty to help others participate in those processes that get us there. So diving right in with the city and the power that we have, I want to just talk about our primary tools that we use when it comes to um, placemaking. And I'm not using those other adjectives anymore because I also think there's some other ones we should put in there. Like we should be looking at sustainable placemaking and placemaking that provides, um, you know, environmental benefits and that type of thing. That said, our most important tools that we have are our 
relationships with community and prioritizing equity design thinking and high performing public spaces wanting to do those things and they really act in tandem across the city and, and other local governments for us to be able to engage with community on making great places the percent for public art policy and the public art program that we have and other traditional resources, and what I mean by that are funding tools like CDBG grants or general funds, all those types of things. Those things are important. They're really important resources that we can that we can leverage. But what we depend on the most is this this other this other thing that happens in every single department in the city. It is not just my department that is creating relationships and figuring out how to use the values that we hold to look at our public spaces in a different way. I do want to break out that we have this percent for public art policy that is a potential funding mechanism to get to that creative piece or to at least help with that creative piece. It is a very, there are three documents. I'm not going to get into a ton of detail, but it's, it, it basically says that when we allocate money to capital projects, we take a look at what that construction costs and we take out all these extraneous pieces, right? Uh, whether or not there's grants that we can't use in, in public art or, uh, you know, we don't want to use right away acquisition money, all those things. But we end up taking 1% of the eligible costs that we deem and we put that aside to be able to hire artists um, to work with us on and the community. When I say us, I mean the community to help make sure that these projects are not just um, anywhere projects. So as I mentioned, you know, these public art funds are very limited. We don't have them on, on everything. And I, I wish that we had some larger pots of public art funding. And we and I actually think that, you know, we may look later about whether or not we want it to just be public art or we want it to be history and culture and all these other things that are just as important to our community when it comes to equitable creative placemaking. The other tool here is prioritizing neighborhood benefits and placekeeping. And so here's just three projects. I'm not sure um, you know, how much everybody knows about these areas, but where we don't have any public art funds, but city is participating in a huge way or is planning to when it comes to perhaps the Deaverview neighborhood to talk about what these places are envisioned to be by their residents and how we can help them get to that place. So I am going to talk really quickly about three projects that are current and underway that have public art funding. Um, they are Jake Rusher Park in South Asheville, the River Arts District's Riverfront, and Downtown's Urban Trail. Jake Rusher Park in South Asheville, uh, if you know where Sycamore Street that is on the left, is a bond project that the city has been working on um, to really uh, create a better um, communal space for the people in the area. And as part of that project, uh, the Parks Department has brought uh, or has had a process to bring on an artist to look at creating an actual piece of play sculpture that the community can help design and and as they move along and have kids and their kids see it, they can point to it and they can say that is something that um, I helped create. The River Arts District right now, um, many of you might know that we're about to have our grand opening. And what we really did in the River Arts District for the, the last several years is create a framework for community to grow. So while that project is huge and transformative and there's a lot of money put into it, we still have a lot of space to move and, and programming is really important, how these spaces um, want to be used by community. And then also doing um, a few public art pieces that the community envisioned years ago is important. We've done some of these, uh, but the iconic gateway, community table and murals are things that are coming up. And the Public Art and Cultural Commission um, in all of the projects I'm talking about plays a role as a city advisory board, plays a role in helping um, engage with community and select artists moving forward. And this is something that we're going to see in the, the next year. We're also currently working on restoration and renovation of Asheville's Urban Trail which it really is a series of 30 monuments in our community that help interpret our history. So these monuments and markers and plaques, um, many of them had been lost throughout the years or damaged, 
um, due to other construction, vandalism, and we have been doing things like putting a new marker in for Guastavino's mark monument. We've moved shopping days as part of the Haywood Streetscape project. We're putting in a new plaque that honors the contributions of the Jewish community. We're reinstalling the Art Deco masterpiece, which honors the, the SNW building and that era of architectural history. And there's a lot to say on that. That plus question mark it could be a discussion point moving forward. And here's a piece from the Urban Trail. It's crossroads. And we really are at a crossroads right now, right? Most of these know these pig and turkey. Um, we're, we are at a crossroads uh, to think about how these kinds of memorials and monuments might mean something in our um, community. So it's located right underneath the Vance Monument, um, which I'm going to talk about now because I was, I was told that this is what I have to talk about. So just kind of kidding. So, um, you know, the Vance Monument is the gateway to Pack Square Park um, on the, the western edge of Pack Square Park. That area that you see circled is only about 900 square feet. And so City Council recently um, uh, voted to approve the demolition of the monument. And uh, we anticipate being able to relay what a schedule for that might look like in the coming, um, the coming weeks. In the meantime, a lot of people have been asking what is next? We've gotten some recommendations from um, lots of community members who, who wanna talk about it. But most importantly, council did put aside about $75,000 to hold a visioning process to have that discussion. So instead of telling you exactly what that process is gonna be, be like, I'm gonna tell you about some things that we need to think about because we are not gonna dictate what that process is gonna be like until we talk with community a whole lot. So if you look around the packed, uh, packed square, packed plaza and the Vance Monument area, there's a ton of other design issues. And you know, through design, we can solve some problems. So these are problems. The north part of Pack Square um, is pretty much a dead zone when it comes to a ped pedestrian activity and the use of public space unless we close it off and we have festivals. And we've seen that to be the case. We've also seen that um, we're kind of prioritizing on-street parking in that area other than being able to use it as a real plaza. And we know that this place is important because it is, you know, it is where people want to be. It is where they want to gather. It is where the vast majority of our demonstrations, protests, and festivals are, are held. There are sections of the park, the one labeled uh, number three on here, for instance, that are inaccessible to people with mobility issues. I'm not exact, you know, we're in a different world now. We don't do that. We have an opportunity. That's a very large area. If you look at that, that's like three or four times the size of the area around the Vance Monument. And it's not accessible to all people. Something we can think about. Uh, we have an entrance to the block that could be activated. That's our historically African-American neighborhood or Wall Street. We have a lot of other public art in the area that hasn't been looked at or interpreted. We're not sure, is it something that we want to stay, go, or an altar? We have um, the Black Lives Matter um, mural in this area. What's the future of that? Who do we need to talk to? We have issues with sidewalks. We have issues with right-of-ways. And then we have all these other assets when it comes to storytelling and placemaking, which is stories we know. And these are just a smattering of stories that we know in the area. I talked about crossroads, you know, looming, the, the looming uh, 60 foot granite obelisk um, sits kind of right over where the segregated, I think they were just segregated women's bathrooms um, uh, were entered in right in front of that. And I believe the remnants are right underneath the Vance Monument because you went underneath that area. Um, James Vester Miller's shop, which was um, in a building that now the Jackson building sits on top of that area, was right off the edge of this area. The county courthouse was here. Um, people were sold into slavery in this area. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for us to think about the histories and stories that we want to tell other than um, the, just the history of the Vance Monument or the crossroads. 
So what I would say is a question that we're going to go out to with the community is, are we really looking at that 900 square foot circle or are we looking at this one and a half acre piece of property as an opportunity for us to be more inclusive and to really think about how public spaces and a creatable, a creative, equitable uh, placemaking process result, like actually have outcomes where this place is where other people want to be and that they feel welcome. Um, if we remove the monument, is that really going to be enough? And I wanted to give a shout out here to some people who have who have put some thought into process in North Carolina. Uh, this these I and you know I said I'm not an expert. I'm actually a student, and these are two of my professors. It's Ellen Deming and Kofi Boone from North Carolina State University School of Design, and they have they have they have been watching what communities have been doing with monument removal all across the state and noticing that everybody does it differently and everybody's plan for afterwards is differently. But when they've looked across um, the spectrum, what shows up as an opportunity is the ability to use what they're calling active narrative as a process to move community forward, to build community, to build trust, and to, to lend um, and inform information to other processes that may be more important than just having a monument or not having a monument. And I'm talking about things like reparations here. So if you think about those two primary tools that the city has and uses, and if our goal is really to not only go from participatory to democratic design, you know, maybe one of the things that we should be thinking about here is uh, really what that process should look like, how thoughtful should that process be, and how meaningful is that process? And is our community ready to participate in something like that in the midst of everything that is going on? Can it be a bigger, a bigger help or a bigger tool than just deciding what happens um, after a monument is removed? So ending, um, ending here with a quote and uh, the visual here is a, a project that um, it was a project managed by uh, Cortina Caldwell who um, couldn't be with us today, but um, she's from Ade and she uh, helped put together a collaboration and worked with about 19 youth from the community to, to talk about what the history of the block really was and how it impacted families and how we might be able to start placing some of those histories in place. So what you see here is a collaboration between Art Ecology, who used those students' um, artworks uh, in a collage method and also historic photographs from the block and the history of urban renewal to help try to create a visual narrative. And then also this piece was inspired by local um, poet and artist Phyllis Utley, her poem, Hope Springs Forth Brightly. So some of those pieces of her poem are on the wall in addition to a mural done by local artist Joseph Pearson that is um, a partially abstracted way of looking at our landscape and how it and sometimes embraces us and sometimes keeps us from having the rich lives that we, uh, that we all desire to have. So I appreciate that and look forward to more of this conversation. Great, thank you, Steph. I really appreciate the overview. And I'm gonna invite up um, our panelists one at a time. And, and as Steph uh, mentioned, Cortina well, could not be with us this morning. Um, she actually got stuck in Africa, some flights got canceled and, and is in a place where she does not have internet access, unfortunately. So we're, you know, we're sad that she's not able to join us this morning, but certainly a key player in this conversation. Um, but I would like to introduce um, Sekou Coleman, the executive director, uh, Asheville Writers in the Schools and Communities. Um, Sekou, would you join us on stage? I know he's gonna do a little bit of a self-introduction and has a video to start uh, for us. So Seiko, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for being with us this morning. I really appreciate it. 
Thanks so much, Ed. Um, and thank you, Stephanie, for your presentation. It was very insightful. Uh, appreciate that. Um, so yes, as was mentioned, my name is Seika Coleman, and I am the Executive Director for Asheville Writers in Schools and Community. We are a North Carolina-based nonprofit that ignites social change through the power of arts, culture, and restorative self-expression. We were founded in 2011 and are committed to social justice and racial, no, <laughs> racial equity through providing youth and adults with opportunities to voice their experiences and their passions through innovative arts and creative writing programming. As an organization, we envision a just and equitable community where the artistic expression, cultural exchange, and voices of black and brown people of all ages are amplified, celebrated, and published. And so how do we make that possible? Well, we do that through three main program initiatives. One of the first program initiatives is known as Family Voices. This is one of our longest running programs. And it is a, um, it's a writing uh, literacy program that works with elementary school children, uh, pairing them with a um, artist mentor and a school teacher to uh, pull from various uh, family and community narratives. So they could be things such as uh, how my mother and father met. They could be, this is the story of how my parents came to this country. This could be a very um, informative uh, family vacation or trip. And it's a writing program. So there's a lot of writing that takes place during the school period. But then in the evenings, there's also um, an opportunity for the families to come together and to share their stories and their writing experience. And at the end of a process, an anthology is put together. Uh, we've done this program in the past, most notably with uh, Hall Fletcher um, and with other elementary schools in the Asheville area as well. So that's one of our program areas. Uh, we also do um, a, uh, a series of artist residencies. Um, and these can look um, any kinds of ways. They could be um, placing um, artists of color in a school setting to work alongside a teacher, very similar to Family Voices, although it may not be a literary program. In the past, we've worked to place uh, visual artists and photographers um, with, um, uh, with school settings. We've also placed artists, uh, teaching artists outside of school settings. So it might be at an after school program at a community center. Uh, it might be during a summer program for a youth group, uh, any of those kinds of things we've all done. Um, and the focus there is to really provide opportunities for um, artists of color to share their experiences, their talent, and their work with the greater community here in Asheville. Um, and then perhaps our most um, popular program uh, and most visible program at this time is one that's known as, um, excuse me, is one that is known as uh, Word on the Street. And so I've got a short video that I wanted to share um, about Word on the Street. And if I'm doing this correctly, um, we will play it. And hopefully we're having some issues earlier with audio. So hopefully it comes through this time. It. Seiku, you're still muted. Yeah, I'm not yes. hearing it. You want me to try it on my end? Okay, let me give me one more second. I, I think I noticed where I share. Instead of doing share, click on the more. Yeah, I got that. I, I, I clicked the wrong thing. So let's try sure. this now. Yeah. You got it now. Where is she? All right, so that was just a brief introduction to some of the programs that we do um, with Astro Writers in the Schools and Community. Uh, really happy to be here today on the panel and talk a little bit about our work and how it connects to what's going on in our community. Uh, so that's my introduction. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Katie Cornell. Yeah, I was going to bring Katie up as well. Uh, you guys know Katie. She's been on all three events so far. Katie's the executive director of the Asheville Area Arts um, Council. And 
uh, been really instrumental in helping us put this program on this whole winter series. So really I'm excited to have her on the panel. And I just wanted to make a quick reminder to our audience that um, if you have questions or as you think of questions that you want to ask uh, any of our panelists, we are using the Q&A feature um, in the program. It should be over on the right hand side. You'll see chat participants and Q&A. If you'll click on that Q&A tab, you can put your questions in there and you can also upvote others questions so that those get answered uh, by our moderators who will be joining us shortly. Katie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I have a couple of slides, too. I'm just going to bring up my presentation really quick. So as Ed said, I'm the executive director of the app. I'm also the chair of the City of Asheville's Public Art and Cultural Commission, but today I'll be talking to you as the executive director of the Arts Council. So um, many of you may not know, but uh, we are the second oldest Arts Council in the state of North Carolina and one of the oldest in the United States. Um, fun fact, the first Arts Council in the United States was actually founded in North Carolina and is the Winston-Salem Arts Council. The Arts Council um, was developed as a subcommittee of the Junior League and incorporated in 1953 with the primary goal of building a civic arts center um, in Pack Square off Spruce Street. Um, and that ended up being folded into the Civic Center project. Um, in 1979, the Arts Council became a 501c3 nonprofit and began our granting program. So we've been doing grants for arts organizations and artists here in our community for over 40 years. We are the designated arts agency for Buncombe County, and uh, that means we receive the state funding for the arts for our, on behalf of our county, which we regrant. So the Arts Council has three primary focus areas. Um, our mission is to keep the arts at the heart of our community, and we do that through advocacy, public art, and services for creatives. Um, so today, I'll be talking to you more uh, about our public art focus. Um, and by that, we um, offer project management services, community engagement services, share calls for artists, and help with programming around public art pieces. So some of the projects that we've worked on in the last year, um, we've assisted with the Wake installation on South Slope, um, which was led by the Community Foundation of Western North Carolina, as well as UNC Asheville. Um, we had planned to do a lot more programming around this piece, but COVID got in the way. Um, but this is uh, Wake by artist Mel Chin, and it really talks about, um, you know, it is, it is about climate change, but it also is talking about dealing with the wreckage of our past, uh, which is a really powerful uh, conversation. And so I, I encourage you to, to check out Mel's um, talks about this piece. Um, it will now be uh, up through the end of the year, so you can still check it out. Uh, we also um, worked with the city of Asheville to manage the installation of a Black Lives Matter mural last year um, in Pack Square. Um, through this project, we were able to directly support 19 artists, um, 17 of which were black artists, and um, it was an amazing experience. Um, that We are contracted to keep that in place for one year, so we're coming up on that uh, the end of that contract in July. So discussions have begun on uh, what's the next step for the Black Lives Matter mural. Uh, we also worked with Explore Asheville this year to um, facilitate artist designs for um, the wear, wait, wash uh, banners that you probably see all over downtown. Um, so three artists were um, selected to put in proposals um, and Will Hornaday from Hornaday Designs was the piece that we ultimately selected. And lastly, um, we have now uh, received grant funding through the Dogwood Health Trust to facilitate community conversation on what should happen to all these storefront protest murals. There's about 150 panels um, currently in climate controlled storage. Um, and uh, we're working with Aisha Adams. Um, so you'll be hearing a lot more about this coming soon. Um, to facilitate uh, conversation around what's the next step for these pieces. So that just gives you a brief overview of what the Arts Council has been up to in the last year. Um, and of course, this speaker series is another piece um, that we have worked on. Um, you know, the City of Asheville's Public Art Master Plan 
is 20 years old. And it's really important that we update and revisit our ideas as a community around public art and creative placemaking. Um, so that was one of the driving uh, reasons why um, I, I approached Ed about doing this speaker series. And it is my hope that we will get a new public art master plan in the next year or so. Um, so this conversation in particular is a good starting point for that. So that's my intro. So I'll invite you back to the stage, the stage Ed. Thanks, Katie. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, we're really looking forward to this continuing conversation. And, and now I'm really uh, excited to bring on our moderators who've been with us for all three of the past events um, and do such a great job here. Dr. Darren Water, Special Assistant to the Chancellor at UNC Asheville and Executive Producer of the Waters and Harvey Show. And Ms. Aisha Adams, uh, Lenore Ryan, Equity and Diversity Institute Program Developer and the executive producer of Asheville View, among many other things that she does. Um, they are gonna take, um, take over now and take our panelists. So invite uh, Seku and uh, Steph to come back on stage as well uh, for a conversation around Asheville and where it's going in equitable creative placemaking. And again, to the audience, this is your time to chime in as well. So if you'll put your questions in the Q and A, um, box on your screen then we and you can also upvote other people's questions there and Darren and Aisha will get to them as they can. Darren, Aisha, Darren I'll turn it over to you. All right well Ed thank you thank you again um, Aisha has once again um, given me the responsibility of getting us started here but before I do that just let me thank uh, Leadership Asheville, and I want to thank Ed and Jan for the work that they've done to put this this bus series together and for the partnerships that have made it possible, especially since we work together at the university. This has been a wonderful conversation. I mean, just a wonderful series, I think, in all of them. They've all been informative and I think very thought provoking. Um, it's been interesting. You know, Aisha, I, you know, I'd love to hear from you, too, how you have felt about these conversations and how important they are. And one of the things I, you know, from the last conversation that, uh, that we had last month that really stood out to me was when we asked the question about, you know, what, what is the goal here? What, what is it that we're after that the presenter said that it is about uh, ensuring or making sure that people have the opportunity to reach their full potential. And so Stephanie, what you said about you know, uh, space can either embrace us or serve as a barrier. Um, I think that's important for us to think about. So I greatly appreciate the conversations and the work that you all are doing. And Aisha, I just want to give you a moment just to kind of say anything in that regard too. This has been an amazing experience for me. And what I'm so excited about is um, I get really excited about art that's used for social change. And so um, the, the conversations that we have has deepened my understanding of how we can use art to solve problems um, and how we can use art as a way of healing. So I'm just really excited about that work and the conversation that we've started. And I'm excited to see how these four conversations will impact our community and how we're able to measure our growth as a community based on these conversations. So again, thank you to Leadership Asheville, the um, Van Winkle firm, Katie and Ed. This is an amazing time for me. Well, thank you, Aisha. And you, we, there was a, a group of questions that I think everybody agreed to before we started today. But in some ways, you know, Stephanie, Sekou, and, and Katie, you've kind of answered the first question about what are you all doing, you know, uh, around the issue of equitable placemaking. And we've heard that. One of the things that, as I will listen to each presentation, that kind of really bubbled to the surface of my mind and I thought would be an interesting question to ask here you're not the only ones who are doing this work. So there's a multiplicity of partners out there um, that are working with each of you. I'm wondering, first of all, how is the community at large responding to the work that you're doing? What can we as individual citizens in the city, uh, members of this community do to kind of enhance that engagement, the engagement that the larger community has? But I just lo love to hear your responses to how the community at large is responding to the work 
that you all have initiated here in your respective areas? Well, I'll, I'll jump in first on that. And, you know, it's, it's a twofold question because with a lot of things, um, there's sort of a pre COVID and a post COVID answer. <laughs> um, and what we were experiencing in the pre COVID time was a very, very positive response. Um, people like doing art, you know, it's, it's one of those things from when you remember in, you know, kindergarten and, you know, elementary school, when you got a time to draw or to paint, or it, there's a really therapeutic kind of value to just the practice of doing it. And then when you mirror it and blend it rather with a social change lens, it becomes even more powerful. Um, so we were always experiencing uh, positive feedback from the various things that we did. I can think, for example, uh, so one of our organizational partners is an entity known as Southside Rising, which is a community-driven collaborative that involves uh, residents from the historically Black neighborhood of Southside in Asheville. Um, and we worked with um, artist mentor uh, Cleasta Cotton, um, and residents of the Southside community, this was a couple of years ago, to do um, sort of like an art, visual art collage project in, um, in the garden as a way of getting input from residents about what they wanted to see in the garden. And so rather than just asking you, okay, well, what do you want? And coming up with a list, here's some paints, here's some supplies, here are some, um, uh, here are some different um magazines and things, have fun and create what you would like to see. And from that session, it ended up leading to different things that now exist in Southside Community Gardens, such as the raised beds and some of the different pieces of art that exist in that particular space right there. So that's always been a good um, thing and really, really happy. Uh, what I can say is post COVID, what we're experiencing is just, you know, there's a little bit of fatigue um, in some of the populations that we've been working with and, and folks are uncertain uh, about the future. They're, uh, they're tired of being in Zoom meetings. They're tired of masks and all these other kinds of things. And so it's requiring us to be a little bit more creative in how we approach the situation and what we do to try and get folks engaged. Does anyone else, you know, Katie, you or Stephanie, you all want to respond to that as well? I'll respond quickly and just say that as opposed to a pre and post COVID, our duality is that we are a government or not government, how we're viewed. And so for the city of Asheville, how people view our work is generally with, um, you know, frankly here, a lot of distrust and concern. Um, basically, uh, this is taxpayer money that's being used. Is it worthwhile? Uh, that type of thing. It's a, it's a different, it's a different lens, but what I can say is that while usually during the process, a lot of, of the public um, and some of the community um, is usually concerned in a potentially negative manner, what they enjoy is the final product of these things, right? So when these things come out, generally say, oh, okay, I didn't know it was gonna be that, like this actually does enhance my place, it's something that I'm gonna use. And so we, you know, you ask, you know, how, uh, like, what can we do to maybe change that or improve that? Um, to me, it's about, uh, you know, the onus is on us as far as building trust to a great extent. Um, but if there was a way for some members of the public to um, help us better understand how to build that trust, that might be that might be something right there. Um, you know, and then the other thing I'd say is people need to take art seriously. Right. This is this is going to be a theme here is that there is a power in arts. Um, uh, I should just set it and we, uh, if you want to see that power realized, then you need to support it. I'll just echo that. Everybody loves the final product, um, but we tend to get pushback on the front end. Uh, people don't uh, recall or, or understand the value of public art. Um, when, when we did the Black Lives Matter mural, uh, we received a lot of pushback originally, you know, people saying that it was performative, um, but it has had great value um, for our community, I think, once it was in place. Um, you know, our public art connects us to a place. Um, it speaks to who we are as a community. Um, it supports our creative community. 
Um, you know, it draws people to our community. There's many, many ways um, that public art enhances the community uh, at large. And, and I would love to see people understand that value a little bit more. That was such a great answer that leads me to my sort of role questioning here. Um, in my understanding of public art, what I've learned is that sometimes public art can be used as a tool for gentrification, um, even if it is not willingly done so. But when that art kind of appears, it brings the value of the neighborhood up. It um, can also make the um, area more attractive to builders and creators who want to come in and do work. How is that narrative going to change for us? What ideas does, does the city have? Um, Seku, as a visionary, how do you see that um, changing, especially because right now we are in such a housing crisis? How can art, Katie, be used as a tool to do some for some undoing? You're exactly right. And that's why you see a lot of communities shifting from public art to creative placemaking programs, um, because you got to have the community in there. It needs to be something that the community is involved in and embraces. Um, Can you define, like we did this whole presentation, but nobody has defined for us the difference between public art and creative placemaking? So creative placemaking is um, adding... Um, like urban design um, artists into the urban design process, um, as well as the people that live, work, and play in an area. Um, so it involves a lot more community engagement before a piece goes in. Um, currently, you know, with the the public art pieces that are put in um, through the city, um, we do have a. a a community engagement process where there's a panel put together of about nine community members um, and then uh, they narrow it down and there's a community input survey. But what we're finding is that's not enough. Um, and so part of this conversation is um, how do we do this better? Uh, and, and that's the equitable creative placemaking piece um, that we're moving towards. Uh, Seku, I would love for you to talk more about this as well. Sure, sure. And what I can provide is an example of, of how this has looked um, in, in action. And, you know, it's uh, nothing's perfect. We're always working to refine and, and get better. But if you recall from the video, one of the young people mentioned about a, uh, a poetry project that was done for the Nasty Branch um, Creek. So for those that don't know, um, the Nasty Branch is a, a waterway that runs um, initially when it was set up, it was basically taking uh, waste and sewage water from North Asheville and downtown, uh, routing it through the Black community, through the South Side neighborhood, uh, on way to the French Broad River. Um, and so uh, at one point it was to be known as the Town Branch River, but the residents of the community always knew it as the Nasty Branch River. Um, and if you are going down Choctaw Street in South Side Asheville, um, there is um, a big park there, um, which is also a place uh, where residents were displaced from their homes because there used to be homes all in that area. And right um, a few hundred yards from the sidewalk on Choctaw Street um, is the creek. And it continues all the way through to the river. So um, the city has decided to, um, in the Greenways project, uh, to enhance that area as part of a greenway. And that brought about, a brought about a little bit of pushback from the community because there was this thing about changing the name uh, from Nasty Branch to Town Branch. It was always called Nasty Branch by the residents. Um, and it was a place there where even though um, I grew up in D.C., so it reminds me of the Anacostia River. Um, um, which was never the cleanest river, but you always went down there, you were always boating on the river or just playing around in that area. Nasty Branch was, was very much and still is very much like that. So cut to a couple of years ago, uh, the city brings in um, some additional support on the creative side with this project. Um, and that included um, um, North Carolina Poet Laureate Jackie Shelton Green, uh, as well as some of the young people from Word on the Street who worked with Miss Jackie to do a, um, a celebration 
of what this uh, creek meant to the community. And so before any words were written that started with tours of the community, that started with interviews of community residents, uh, elders from the community talking about what the creek meant. And then um, um, Miss Jackie worked with the young people to engage them in writing um, this poem. They each wrote their individual poems and then Miss Jackie pulled it all together into one uh, really, really beautiful, it's, it's way too long to read here and share now, but it's a really, really great movie moving piece that honors and includes all of the work from the young ladies that were involved in the program. So now we're in the process of working with uh, the city and the designer and UNCA Steam Studio to place components of that poem along the um, uh, along the walkway, along the uh, the greenway. And so that's a way of taking um, and honoring what the community has seen and what the community believes in um, and, and making sure that it has um, it still has place within the um, within the community moving forward. Um, and so, as I said, it's not necessarily perfect because, you know, there's still it within the community, you know, you still have high instances of gentrification uh, and the Greenway is also one of the things that could lead to more of that in the future. Um, and Southside is currently an area with uh, one of the highest pop concentrations of public housing in the city of Asheville, um, which is also problematic, but this is definitely a good start and and a, a roadmap for how communities can be engaged in having a say uh, at how art uh, shapes their their environment. It's, it's, I think that, you know, um, the point that you just made, I think it is worth kind of dwelling on for, for, a, for a minute here, because Stephanie has brought up the issue of trust. And I'm, I'm wondering, this process, this process of engagement, can, can you can you from that have you gather any sense of how that is working to rebuild that trust and i'm also wondering as well stephanie as we look at this and we look at the issue of funding because one of the things that has always troubled me is how you know we get people in communities to engage in the process they do this work and sometimes they're not supported financially or economically in the work they're doing and i'm wondering are we finding a way to kind of, you know, bring that to an end that people are being financially supported for the work that they're they're actually doing? So it's a two part question again, Sekou. And so I would love just to hear a kind of a, a broad response to that. Sure. Well, initially on the trust issue, you know, the the reality is the 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 harm has been done. Um, and and the, the trust is in many ways is, is still not there. Um, we talked about, or I talked about the Greenway project, uh, another more um, timely um, situation, uh, again, in the Southside community is what's happening with uh, Walton Street Park and the pool. Um, and there's a long, long history. So this park uh, originally was uh, black farmland um, and the pool there was one, uh, if I remember correctly, was the first pool for black residents in the city. Uh, of Asheville. It's now a city property. Um, and it has not been uh, well maintained over the years. Uh, the city has plans to build a new pool at the Grant Center, which is down the street from the pool, uh, which is down the street from Wall Street Pool. And there has been a long period of back and forth between residents of the community and the city around, well, what do you want to see? How can we preserve this space? The uh, residents have come forward, have said things that they wanted, and the city has not always honored those things. And so now, as you try and go out and get that input, folks from the community are like, well, you know what, forget y'all, because y'all didn't listen to us the last time. So what makes us, even if you do come with money for um, uh, for stipends and incentives, as has been the case now, people are still very, very slow to be engaged because they do not feel as though their voices have been heard and that their um, their input has been respected over the years. Um, Sekou, if you could put in the general chat how um, people can actually view or read the poem that you spoke about, that would be really helpful. Um, as one sure. of the questions. My question um, is kind of based off of Darren's question and Sekou's answer, and it's probably more of a Katie and Stephanie question. How is the city measuring the growth of the work that they're doing? 
How are they measuring how they're going to be building that trust back and how is it going? So as Sekou said, I can't believe we're still talking about the pool. I, I just thought that was resolved um, <laughs> by now, but it's been many years, probably as long as I've been in the Asheville area, actually. Um, and so how how does the city or how can art, public art or a creative place making, Katie, be measured? How can that success be measured? I'll, I'll start. And actually, I'm going to answer by telling you what the gold standard is and where we want to go. So if people are interested, look up Reimagining the Civic Commons. This is an organization that works across the United States um, with in, in different communities to do exactly what you're talking about, which is to, to and, and I'm talking about public spaces in this particular instance, but it, it measures um, social indicators um, of and, and outcomes that we want to see, like trust. They have a DIY toolkit that's up on their website that basically takes you um, through all the different things that you would like to do. Their one kind of low spot is public health, um, but in public space and how you want to, to see that um, measured and, and how you can track it. So um, we haven't adopted this um, yet. Uh, but, I, you know, I, my division in, and others are looking at that and other examples for ways of having some kind of um, uh, uh, a process with community. I can tell you that um, Alexa Bush in Detroit, she's one of the senior planners in Detroit. She uses um, the system and she and getting back to the question about, fi you know, financially compensating people, what they're doing in Detroit is paying people to learn how to track these outcomes themselves. So really empowering communities, not not giving up the responsibility of figuring out whether or not that trust or other outcomes have been created, but really empowering communities to hold the government accountable and say this isn't working or it is. So that's where we want to go. That's what I'll say. And I'll say, um, you know, the first step is realizing there's an issue. And then the next step, which is very important, is analysis. And, you know, seeing what other people are doing, really looking at we, what we should be doing before you jump into action. And so that, for me, is why a new master plan is so important for our community. Because we know that the one that we have is outdated and not working. And we need to update our policies and procedures but I don't know what the answer is yet. Uh, we need to engage in that process. Uh, Aisha, some of the questions that are uh, coming up in the chat, um, Bill, and I, and I want to make sure that we uh, bring up some of those. I am I am curious for everyone, you know, and say, could you keep making things pop up in my mind and your responses and i am i'm wondering how how all of this might all of the, this conversation and even around placemaking and in art and public art how all of this might factor into to to the upcoming conversations around reparations um so this is clearly going to play right and i'll give you a chance to respond to that say good so sure and everybody, anybody who wants to i mean here, but I, I'm wondering about that because these conversations are coming. And so I'm wondering how this is going to factor into that. Sure. Well, you know, I think, you know, I, I think it's important to realize that, or at least to contextualize our understanding of art and the power of art, as I should mention in the beginning of the uh, panel. Um, what we look at art now or how we envision art now is very different from how um, indigenous cultures uh, historically have used art. You know, uh, art was a, uh, a part of healing. Uh, art was a part of everyday life, right? And so it's a part of uh, connecting and tapping into a deeper uh, place within yourself to bring out um, uh, uh, creativity to bring out a closer sense to uh, spirituality, to a closer connection to, to the earth, to family and so forth. Um, in terms of how art can be used, um, because art is really anything that um, 
pulls upon the creativity, pulls upon the ingenuity um, of, of the individual. So um, I'm reminded of a visioning session um, that was led at one point. I participated in this session. It was led by a good friend, Tomiko Ambrose Murray. And uh, this took place uh, shortly after the release of the movie Black Panther. Um, and so there was a lot of excitement about the movie and the lore of Black Panther. And for those who may not know or may not remember, uh, one of the key things um, in Black Panther uh, was the location of Wakanda, which is an African nation uh, that was totally and completely sovereign. Um, and the strength and the power of Wakanda came from this, this mineral uh, known as vibranium. Um, and so as we began to vision how we wanted to see uh, the future be different in the community, uh, Tomiko challenged us to think, what is our vibranium? What is that thing that we have that nobody else has that can be a powerful source for leading us into a different future? Um, and, and really, that movie that art itself um, is a work of Afrofuturism, uh, is a work of examining, you know, Octavia Butler often talked about how science fiction um, and social justice uh, come together because you're imagining things that haven't been done yet and imagining how they can be done. So I think that art has always been the tool that we needed to use to, to, to do things better. And we've just sort of gotten so caught up in the hustle and bustle and extraction of capitalism and competition that we've forgotten about that because we can only think about how can we commodify art in order to make money off of it in order to fill it into this particular thing. So I think by flipping the narrative and getting people to think about how art is that piece for pulling out those ideas. That's a really, really good start there. But I'll, you know, that's just my perspective. I felt like I was going to ask about, you know, for me, what I've seen is a lot of the projects that we've talked about has sort of this historical piece to it and not a futurism piece to it. Um, and so I want to take a moment to acknowledge city councilwoman Kim Rooney, who is in the audience and who has a question um about deficits specifically and she says as an artist and educator in performing arts it can be challenging to define needs for artists working in intangible installation spoken word have youth artists name place making deficits or has anyone um for that matter name place making deficits well, yeah, I, I think one of the, the key things that has been a, a, a dominant and recurring theme in conversations is just um, not feeling wanted, particularly for members of our black and brown communities here in Nashville, not hearing seen, um, um, not feeling seen, not feeling heard. Um, and so what is um, uh, what's happening, uh, particularly in the work that we're doing, is trying to let people know that, you know, you belong. Um, and your voice matters. So, you know, if you recall from the beginning, we talked about the Family Voices program. Um, that's really working with people who don't see themselves as writers and saying, no, you've got a story. Your story is important. Let's work with you and get you to write this. Uh, and then let's save it. Let's put it into an anthology so it's there for years to come. The young ladies who have been working on the um, uh, on, on the Nasty Branch project, you know, their words are going to be, you know, memorialized and saved for future viewing audiences. A lot of, we kind of don't even think about the deficits um, because we work with people who many times don't even see themselves as artists. Uh, and we bring them in. If you talk to any of the kids in Word on the Street, they're not in the program because they want to be artists. They're in the program because they feel a sense of family. They feel a sense of belonging. They feel a sense of place. And, and that, is, that is really important. We're talking about place making, but I really see this work as place healing. It's healing through providing people with an opportunity to feel heard, feel seen, feel as though they belong. So yeah, we, that's how we sort of approach the situation. I wanted, I, before I jumped in here, give anybody else so katie uh, uh stephanie we wanted to respond to that as well but i'm also thinking about we're, we're talking about youth here i'm wondering about older older citizens in our community what engagement are we doing with them um 
Because I, I'm surprised, I, I'll say this, I'm surprised that, you know, traveling across the state involved with organizations across the state and and one in particular working with the William Friday Fellowship, I was recently with a group of those fellows in Wilson, North Carolina, and and two of the older members of the current cohort were, you know, talking about how they felt uh, a bit uncomfortable with the younger members of the of the cohort because they didn't feel like we really have anything to offer or anything to say but the power of their experiences and stories uh, once you hear them are so important so i wonder what we're doing to engage that community as well in this conversation and especially for those because mitch landrew brought this up as he even in his engagement with his own mother around many of the monuments in new orleans and how she she saw those places as you know kind of almost in a nostalgic way because of their engagement with them and there was something that was being lost in that as certain things were being removed so how do we engage those communities in a way where they're they're included in the conversation well <laughs> at the risk of sound like i'm monopolizing the whole panel here um i i do uh actually have an example um, so we have been partnering for the better part of a year now with the Southern Appalachians Highlands Conservancy um, in a project to sort of honor and document the stories in the community um, in the Alexander area. Uh, there's a historically black uh, community there that was given land, uh, had a church um, well, and a funeral. And as they were doing their con conservation work in the area, they began to realize uh, as they work with the residents that there were, and these are, these are elders in this particular community, um, and that there's a lot of stories and there's a lot of history and there's no there's no record of this. And so they reached out, uh, Southern Appalachians Highlands Conservancy reached out to us to see if we could partner and bring some of our young people and some of our artists in to uh, collect some of those stories and to share them. Uh, we also did a project a few years ago, again in Southside, uh, which was called Southside Stories, where we invited elders from the community to come and share their stories. So it's really about an intergenerational work that we do by bringing the young people to connect with the elders in the community to hear and learn about how things have, have changed how things are still the same and provide some context for all of that and to do it um using art whether that is you know collage whether that's writing whether that's photography whether that's video whether that's poetry spoken word it doesn't matter let's just bring these people together um and because that's so incredibly important as we move forward That's awesome. Um, I wanted, um, I know there's a think tank upcoming, but curious, is there an aim to alter the obliques before it comes down or break apart, save the pieces similar to the Berlin Wall? Um, that was a question from Ellen Green. Okay, so you're talking about the, the obelisk, the Vance Monument. Um, no, there is not an aim to to keep any of that. <laughs> no, we're not memorializing and uh, valorizing white supremacy by keeping pieces of it. That's that's not the aim of this uh, piece. It, it will be demolished. And um, honestly, if you take a look at the contract for the uh, for the demolition, um, you know the pieces will are not able to be you know recognizable. They can be used as fill and demolition. Uh, type of material. Um, and then Amy asks, what is one takeaway each of you want all of us to have? So let's start with Katie. Well, um, actually I have a question for everybody. Um, so the Arts Council on our homepage, on our website, uh, we have a survey, a community survey, um, cause we wanna hear from all of you before we decide on any kind of next steps. Um, and so the question is, it's just one question, what would you like to see included in Asheville Buncombe equitable creative placemaking slash arts and cultural master plan? Um, so I'll put a, a link uh, in the Q&A to the Arts Council's website, but let us hear from you. Uh, we want to hear you, uh, your opinions about this as well.
Steph. <laughs> Okay, so I'm very lucky here in that my takeaway was um, iterated by Se Seku. <laughs> and that, that is, if, if I want people to walk away with one thing, it really is the, the power of working together and using art to create community and how what we're talking about here is, is not like, we're so excited about the, the final thing. It's a pretty picture or but it's the work that we do together to build a more equitable com community that matters and that the tool we're talking about is creative placemaking through that. So that that's what I want people to think about. Last little bit would be, uh, and then how does that fit into the, the incredibly important pieces of work we have upcoming, like looking at the heart of our downtown, the main intersection of our downtown and whether or not people are gonna feel included and they feel that sense of belonging that Seiko talked about for, you know, in the coming years. Thanks, Seth. I think uh, for uh, from my perspective, uh, I'd love for people to to take away the the realization that our organization um, is really at the the forefront of uh, connecting artists of color and communities of color uh, through the lens of um, equitable change and and social justice here in Asheville. Uh, so, if there's anything that um, uh, that those of you in the audience could could take from this, um, is just that that we exist and that we are always uh, looking for support. Support can be amplifying our narrative. So just sharing the fact that we are here uh, with others who may not know about us. Uh, it could also be making contributions. It could also be uh, supporting our work in a variety of different ways that are not necessarily financial, um, but just helping us to amplify and elevate our narrative and support the work of these young people uh, and, and the village of, of artists and community residents that support them. For I have one, I have one more takeaway, and that would be for people to understand the value of, of art and creative placemaking. Um, you know, I, I don't know why we keep forgetting how important it is, um, particularly as we move into the healing process. We got a lot of healing to do as a community, racial healing, uh, moving past COVID, you know, uh, relaunching our local economy after a very tough year. Um, and I don't want people to forget the role the arts play in that process. You know, there there is one, we have a few more minutes here and I usually, if I can, there is one question that has come in that I think is really important. And given, you know, my, the, all of the conversation around the I-26 connector and, you know, my grandmother, my grandparents, lived in the Burton Street community. And up until her time of death, this was a major, in, two, in uh, 2003, this was a major concern of hers and the impact on that Burton Street community. But the question I think is really good is, and I'd love to hear you respond to this, is there any way to get the state DOT to understand equitable, creative placemaking so that we can bring in artists' perspectives into the design uh, into designing the I-26 connector. You know, Stephanie, what I'll, you know, I'll say a couple things. I mean, I'll say one that is that people might be surprised to know that actually there, you know, or if you don't already know, there's an I-26 aesthetics committee. We probably don't all love that name anymore, but um, that uh, has taken a look at how to bring artist perspectives into the design of the I-26 uh, connector. And if you take a look at any of the uh, vol uh, volumes of reports that have come out, you'll see some of those things in there. Um, so, but I guess the other thing I have to say is like, you know, again, this is, we're looking for democratic design. And if you say, is there any way to get the state DOT? These people work for you. <laughs> They're public servants. <laughs> and I know it's really hard and I don't expect everybody, it, it's exhausting. I understand that it's exhausting for all of us, but that is the, um, that's the only way, democracy. Stephanie, I, you know, <laughs> democracy is hard work. Is it, it calls for real engagement, it does. And I, you know, I can't say that enough. So thank you for making that point. Just, you know, those first three words in the constitution are very important to me. We, the people, you know, we have a role here. 
Katie, go ahead. So I actually have something to add. There is federal legislation that has been introduced um, in, in this uh, session called the STAR Act. And what it would do is give transit authorities the ability to do public art. Um, and so I'm going to put a link to that in the feed. Um, but yeah, uh, right now it's it's much more difficult um, to include artists in, in that process. But there has been a lot of um, studies done um, that shows the um, how public art in, in transit helps um, with traffic calming and is a really positive um, addition um, as well as making our highways more attractive. Um, but I'll, I'll share the link to that in the feed. Darren, I have a question for you. <laughs> this is it, right? So we're down to the last two minutes. We've done four of these. We've had a great time. I see some people um, in the audience that made all four. What is your biggest takeaway? What are you taking back to your work from this talk? Um, and the conversations we've had. Well, thank you, Aisha. Um, I should have known that you would do that to me. So uh, <laughs> what I'm here for. I think that what's important for me here is just building, how can we really firm up and build a sense of community, right? I was listening to what Katie, Stephanie, and, and Sekou were talking about in their takeaways about you know, renewing this sense of community among us. And I couldn't help but think, and I reached over to pick up an article that uh, that I read reoccurring. I, I read this quite often, I go back to it, but I think it was 19, 1938, uh, Albert Einstein had been getting these questions all the time about what do you believe? And he wrote this short essay and, and he said these words in it, which I think are important. I was reminded as I listened to everybody respond to their takeaways, where he ended up saying at one point, he said, from the standpoint of daily life, however, there is one thing we do know that man is here for the sake of other men. And so we can change the word man to say that we're all here for the sake of each other. And above all, for those whose smiles and well being, our own happiness depends, and also for the countless unknown souls with whose fate we are connected by a bond of sympathy. That's my big takeaway from all of these conversations. And I think, and I hope that is something that we, that we'll ha have a deeper sense of. So thank you, Aisha. Aisha, I'm so glad you asked uh, Darren that question. It, uh, he needed to be out there as well. And I'd love to ask you that same question that for you, the takeaway uh, from the last four months and, and really thank you for doing this because it's really been such a, a beautiful event and way to bring the community together. But what for you it would be the takeaway? I think for me, the biggest takeaway has been this idea that these conversations can make a difference. I think as a Black woman who is underfunded in my pursuit of using art as a form of social change, just to be a part of the conversation, um, to, to see my city council show up, to hear, um, to see our mayor here, to just like see these conversations happening and to see this change is very hopeful for me. And so I leave with a sense of hope and positivity and excitement for the work that Sekou and Stephanie and Katie is doing and like just wanting to plug in more, wanting to be more connected, wanting to be a part of the community that everybody is talking about. Great, and we thank you so much for being here. All of you, I, I can't uh, say it enough how much I appreciate you taking time to join us this morning. Uh, Darren, Aisha, Katie, Sekou, uh, Stephanie, really thank you so much. It's your expertise and what you bring to our community is powerful and very much needed. Um, and, and Darren, I appreciate you getting to that question about the I-26 connector, because I don't know that a lot of us think about those things from an artistic perspective. Um, and, you know, if we really start, if we can change that mindset, say, like you said, we can flip it and begin to look at, you know, we could have an iconic bridge as the entrance into Asheville instead of just a concrete mass. Um, but it means that we, uh, we the people, we have to step up and petition the state and to get representatives who can begin to understand that, look, we want our community to look nice. And there's some gorgeous bridges 
that the DOT has put up in other states. Uh, I think of the one in Tampa Bay, there's a couple of others that really define their city and make it such a beautiful thing. That's just one small piece of it. Um, and so again, my charge to, to you in the audience is, you know, it, it's your civic duty to step up and make your voice heard and, and to maybe think about these things in a different way and to continue these conversations with your neighbors about how can we get involved? Should we write letters to our representatives, our state representatives and ask for these things that make our place that much better and make it equitable for everybody who lives here? Um, so with that, we're going to be shifting back to conversation mode so that you can join and talk to people at the table. Again, thank you to our panelists. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Aisha and Darren. You've done a fabulous job moderating the whole series. And again, want to thank our, our presenting sponsor, Van Winkle Law Firm, for really making this happen. Our, our platinum sponsor, Explore Asheville and the North Carolina Arts Council. Without your help, we wouldn't be able to bring in the quality speakers and panelists that we have. Our featured sponsors, AV Tech, uh, AVL Technologies, Arby's, Lenore Ryan uh, University, the Equity and Diversity Institute, um, uh, Raul Real Estate, um, African Americans in Western North Carolina, and Young Professionals really appreciate it. Our table sponsors, our sustaining sponsors, everybody who's in the planning team who really did great work around making this happen. And Katie, thank you for bringing the idea to us last summer um, and, and really appreciate it. Two other thank you for all your support and making it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, two other announcements from Leadership Asheville. One, we are taking applications. It's kind of the process is currently open for the flagship program, Leadership Asheville Class 40. We hit our 40th anniversary that starts next September. Uh, we're really excited about that. We are planning on doing it in person. Uh, based on, of course, CDC guidelines and health guidelines at the time. But at this moment, we are planning on doing it in person and really looking forward. So if you want to be more involved in the community and these community conversations, the flagship program is a fabulous way to learn some of the intricacies and to meet some of the key people who are doing the work in our community. I strongly urge you to do that. Steph is a LA 26 grad, I believe. Myself, I was an LA 31 grad. Um, so please, you know, think about it. Our uh, the application and all the information about the program and dates are on our website, uh, www.leadershipashville.unca.edu. So please go in and check it out there. And the second thing that I want to throw out was an announcement that we normally do the summer buzz breakfast in June, July, and August. We are pushing it back this year to August, September, October, with the hope that we can do it in 3D that we can actually meet in person and share a meal together. Um, of course, we will follow all health protocol guidelines and CDC guidelines um, and, and keep our fingers crossed that that actually happens in August. So keep an eye out for announcements about those happening uh, and, and hopefully we can make them in person because this has been wonderful. We've been able to bring in people that I don't think we would have been able to, uh, but virtual has helped do that. But I also really like meeting in person and, and sharing a meal together. And I look forward to doing that very soon. So thank you all. And we'll go back to conversation. Can I, can I make one last plug? Sure. Fill out the survey. Let us hear from you. Share it with others. Go to AshevilleArts.com and you'll see it right there on the homepage. Perfect. Thank you all and, and enjoy. Please stick around and talk with folks at your table and go visit others at other tables. You can double click to go to other places. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.